yeah, I would uh, go for it. <coughs> yeah, okay. Let's just make sure these are all landing. Hang on a second. Make sure they're all online. Right, I've got a good online. Good. We are sort right. of live. Okay, I'm going to uh, broadcast and just start letting people into the room. Brilliant, thank you. So we'll, uh, we are live. Let me just check that um, I've got people watching Facebook and YouTube. Um, let's just make sure. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll start it just in a second, but we'll, uh, we'll let some people in. If you look in there, oh, hello. If you look in your, the bottom bar, I don't know if you've got that on your screens, there's a participant button, but it's got some numbers in it and it should be going up. They're all the people that might be watching, but turn that off. Don't think about it. I'm doing Zoom on an iPad, which is just terrible, so I can't see. I can see. You haven't got any? Good. Same, well, same. We don't. Oh, we don't need to worry about that then. It's I'm just going to make sure that we're all good on that we're all good on YouTube and everywhere. We've got people watching. We've got spies out. Okay. Here we go. Any second now. Mine has subtitles. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's... Mine's got subtitles. That's incredible. In English or, or you know. In English, yeah, <laughs> it should be. Well, we've got live, live uh, closed captions. Ah, really? So if you, uh, if uh, the people in the webinar can uh, hit their, hit their, the CC uh, button, if anyone can, then uh, you will get live captions. Brilliant. We're good on YouTube. So here we are. Welcome to this uh, this BSC masterclass brought to you by our friends, uh, um, uh, BAFTA. Um, uh, tonight we're talking about a recent series directed by Alex Garland for FX on Hulu and uh, and the BBC, which landed here in the UK not too long ago, but uh, truly provided us with a, a bit of a reality check in our uh, lockdown. It says here, beautiful and captivating, breathtakingly audacious, and that was just from the, the new scientist. So welcome. Uh, of course, we're talking about the project Debs, and we're joined today by um, the director of photography, Rob Hardy, BSC. Hello, Rob. And, Hello. Uh, Andrew Whitehurst, the VFX supervisor, and Hello. Asa Shaw, the uh, DI colorist. Welcome, Hello. gentlemen. Thank you. Fantastic that you're, uh, you've all found time to meet us. I mean, you're, uh, you're, Asa, you're busy, but um, uh, Andrew and Rob, I don't know what you're up to. Whereabouts are you and what have you been up to? Uh, well, I'm in Atlanta still. Um, we've been here th throughout the whole lockdown thing. Um, we started a film here, started prepping a film here, then it shut down and, um, you know, I've got my, got my little ones, my family here, so rather than jumping on a plane back to London, we decided to just stay, sweat it out, and um, it looks like the film might be coming back soon, so we're still here, um, enjoying Fantastic. the very, very hot weather, it's getting, into that, getting into that world at the moment. Yeah, of course. Andrew, whereabouts are you? Uh, I'm in South East London, um, which is sunny and pleasant, uh, yes. <laughs> as it always is. You know, yes, of course, south of um, Yeah, I'm <coughs> fairly busy um, looking for the projects that are coming up, so figuring out what we're going to be doing next, of which it looks like there's a lot. So I think as soon as we get going, we're going to get going pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was shaping up to be a very strong year, hasn't it? And then it's kind of, um, yes, all sorts of things have changed, including, uh, yes, the, the pandemic has set us back. So we might have to write this year off a little bit. But um, and Asa, you're, you're working, right? Nothing yeah. stops the colorists. No, it doesn't seem to. I think most are working in Soho. Um, I'm in sunny and much nicer North London and um, working in Soho all the way through. We looked at me working remotely and I've got a few mates that are working remotely but really for the amount of work we had to get through I don't think it was going to work and so I pretty much insisted and begged that I'd be allowed to stay in so I'm the only person in the building other than security guards and occasional maintenance um, and the rest of my team are all at home successfully hooked up and working unbelievably hard. Fantastic. 
it is possible then but it's not i mean i think you were saying it's not it's yeah. not ideal but it's but you you are making it yeah no we're we're, we're plowing through people are chucking you know cut changes at us vfx versions 30 something um you know new mixes everything we're making huge files and sending that to clients doing clear view which is live grading sessions with up to 10 clients at the same time uh so yeah it's just it's just a slightly different way of working um but it's uh it, it's yeah successful so far well that's good good to hear that it's not uh, that not everything is ground to halt um you've all worked together before um uh, not just on uh, is it just on on alex garland projects but can you tell me how how, what was the first thing that you all worked together on and how, how did that come about? Rob, how did you, uh, how did you kick well, this I off? Well, I think actually, I think with Ace, uh, was it in Stolen? Or was it st Stolen? I think it was Stolen, Justin's. Right. So, yeah, so there was, um, it was like a, it's like a sort of one-off feature length TV, a film made for TV, uh, which we shot in Manchester, actually. Um, I seem to remember we shot that two Two Perth. Two Perth, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, that's the first time we met. And then um, with Andrew, and actually, so we've been we've been pretty much working together ever since, haven't we, Asa? I think, or at least I, I yeah. hope. Um, yes, there was a Swedish film I didn't do, but then it was a German yes. thing. German. So we set, we set the look on it, which was beautiful yeah. and yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, and Andrew and I, we well, we first worked together on um, Ex Machina, right? Yep. Yeah, and all, all of the consequently the other two Garland productions. <laughs> DNA. <laughs> That's where the the, uh, the dream team finally came together. Um, so, how, so Debs, how did that come about? I mean, if uh, I think it's, um, I think I read somewhere that Alex mentioned that it was a, a almost a companion piece with Ex Machina. Um, so how did it, how did it come about for uh, for you, Rob? How did uh, when did you first hear about it? Um, we we were talking about the net whatever that next thing would be uh, come, when we were coming towards the end of shooting Annihilation, um, and then also when we when we got into the into the DI suite. So there were there were sort of rumblings about what that might be, and I think at that point really. For Alex, it was more his interests were, were lying more in the idea of doing something uh, much more expansive, um, and consequently a sort of episodic thing. Meaning, but but not not in a way, not a sort of repetitive series, but just you know, like the idea it would be a one-off in some way. And then um, there was a, there was another thing that he started writing that we talked about for a while within that framework. It was set in New York, uh, which never came to fruition. But then this this appeared, Debs appeared, and it sort of appeared out of nowhere. Um, I'm sure Andrew probably knows a little bit more about that process uh, than I do the early the early part of that process. But but from my point of view, I was I was coming to the end of I was still shooting Mission Impossible, and I was coming to the end of that. And then Alex started to drip feed uh, episodes to me, so he sent me the first two. And it was just like, he just basically just started writing it. And uh, I read those, loved it, immediately loved it. And I was like, okay, so just send me the rest. He's like, well, I haven't written the rest yet. I'm still, you know, I'm halfway through three. So then he would, he was lit, he was writing so quickly. He would just churn them out. And one by one, they would come to me every couple of weeks. The next episode. It was a bit like, it was a bit like watching it, you know, it was a bit <laughs> so, so I had to wait for the next episode for a couple of weeks. And uh, it was great. It was, and and actually the script, maybe you could back me up on this, Andrew, or not. I don't know. But the script, um, it felt didn't change very much at no. all no. from that first draft, which is extraordinary. <laughs> because usually it's like, you know, that's that's the first thing. And but you read it, it, it felt complete as it was. So so soon so, so as soon as those things were, you know, as soon as I got the chance to absorb that, already we were having conversations about how we're going to do this yeah i mean i mean it's uh alex is with, with especially with the three projects that you've all done together is that it's dealing with quite high concept uh uh technology 
Um, did you all, uh, you're all obviously experts on quantum computing and determinism. <laughs> yeah. And so you brought that to the project. We brought that, I, yeah, in fact, that was, uh, all three of us had this idea at the same time. <laughs> and we took it to Alex. It was like, maybe it should be about this. Yeah. <laughs> and he just weaved it in, yeah. amazing. He just weaved it in. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, con con uh, concept stage. I mean, obviously, it, um, uh, how, how early how early on were you were you each involved, Andrew? Were you involved quite early on in terms of that concept? Yeah, I mean, so it's, I found out about the concept for the show at the same time as Rob. So it was it was literally right as we were coming towards the end of post on Annihilation, um, and that had been a long hall for, for me and for also for Alex because we started at, at the beginning of prep and obviously work continually right away through to the end of post so I was on annihilation for two and a half years something like that um, and so I took some time off at the end of it um, and Alex takes Andrew having time off as in I will phone Andrew most mornings at about eight o'clock and ask him difficult questions um, <laughs> And so he, I get the phone call uh, and we would go talk about whatever he wanted to talk about. And then sort of two days later, an episode would, and then would, would be sent out and then I would realise why he was asking the questions that he was asking. Um, and so that was, so it was, I had slightly more inkling maybe than, than Rob did as to what was coming next, but only by about two days because of how I'd had my ear bent uh, to sort of talk things through. Um, and, and as, as Rob said, it, it emerged fully formed, pretty much. I mean, there's, it, it's all there in the first draft. Subtle things changed inevitably, but really, it was a done deal from from first day. So, I mean, obviously, all these the, 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 all the best things start with amazing source material. But I guess in terms of, um, I mean, his concept was kind of like you say was fully formed. From the, from the off, but so how did you uh, how did how did that work in terms of prep and and how you came to where you came to and made those decisions, Rob? To, I mean, you've worked with um, Mark Digby was the production designer, yeah, who you'd all worked with before. So I guess it's that uh, that continuing yeah. team. So it's the same team that, that we started with with X Mac and through Annihilation, and then then on to Devs. So that, so there was already that kind of shorthand from the very beginning and. I think what's what's interesting about the process that we tend to have is that because the scripts tend to be quite fully formed, we have quite an early springboard into you know what it, what kind of world are we looking at and how we how do we create that? And so working with Mark and also Michelle Day, who's who's she's credited as art director, but they, I mean they work together as a team essentially um one and the same basically so so we start that we start those conversations very early and and really what we're trying to do ultimately is to just talk about you know create the world as um as fully formed as possible before we get anywhere near a set or anywhere near a location so that when we arrive in those places we already know we already have this sort of foundation so that that prep period tends to be quite um, uh, thorough, uh, incredibly thorough, and concepts will come in and then will be discarded or adjusted or you know. But these things happen very, very quickly. It's not, you know, the thing. I think the thing with Alex is uh, he, as I was saying earlier, he he sort of it's like you know decisions are made like that, and 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 really it's in, it's decisions that are often based on instinct, and that instinct ultimately comes down to do we think it's you know, do we like it or don't we like it? And and without reasoning too much about what's behind the concept, it's just like this could be really cool, or that's not so so cool, or or you know stuff like that. So so essentially, we want to we want to create this world so that when we walk into it, we can, from my point of view anyway, I can practically shoot in any direction, and and we have the floor. So so it's very much about creating those worlds. And it, if we don't, I mean, the work. The way I work with Alex is we tend not to use any references at all outside of what we're doing, outside of the script itself. Um, and that's not because we don't, you know, we're like, we're never using other references, but it's just, it just never really occurs to us because we're too sort of wrapped up in 
in, you know, what the hell is this, this thing going to look like and how does it feel here and what's that? And, you know, and then, I, you know, the process again is, and I won't speak for Andrew, but he's very, not dissimilar, but, but it's much more involved in, from a conceptual point of view, but maybe you can say it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would say my, my experience is, is probably the same as yours, is that it's, there's usually not that much um, I would make it look like something else pre-existing. Um, it's a, a conversation. Um, Alex is someone who is good at looking at very rough, broad brushstrokes ideas. So I will often just really loosely sketch something and say, you know, something like this. And they'll go, yes, yes, no, not that, maybe this bit, whatever. And you know, Rob will chip in as well, and, and so will Marco and Mish. And similarly, Rob and I and Alex will often be going around art departments and Mark and Mitch will be going, come on, this, come on, this, what do you think of this? And I mean, I remember when they were figuring out the gold panel that you can see behind uh, Acer and they were going around, they got all of these different finishes and it's like, which one, which one? It's like, um, I quite like that one. It's like, oh, interesting. It's like, one? <laughs> um, but it's, it's always that sort of continual uh, creative refinement and chucking ideas out and everybody is always contributing and is helping other people out and saying well you know actually this is a good idea for this and that's how it, it works and that's how it's and it worked like that on Machina and on annihilation and on this and i think yeah. because we've all been working together so long that a lot of that is almost semi-telepathic now yeah yeah it's it's a it's a very sort of democratic process in a way um, because you do, as Andrew said, you know, we'll, we'll walk from room to room and it's always like, irrespective of where, whether you're in the art department, costume lighting, whatever, the effects department, we, we will, it, it's, it's in constant motion. So as we're, you know, as we're moving from room to room, conversations might happen, ideas might come or be discarded. It's, you know, so it's, it's, it's a really energetic process. And it's like, it's sort of very, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it kind of, it, it really works with your intuition. You're not, you're not afraid to use it and not afraid to say if you think something's shit, you know, it's because if it is, it is. And then you move on from it. And nobody's precious about anything really um, because we all just want the same thing. We all want it to be as best as it as it possibly can be and that and i think alex's strength is really one of his many strengths is really that like pushing and pushing and pushing to see how far we can take something and i mean in in the grade we often get to that point where you know alex will say it's just keep going until it breaks and then mm. and we'll know uh we've gone too far and that's 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 the roof so that's and we'll pull it back from there and, and that's how we still tend to work I, i'd quite like to add as well that acer comes in on that in pre-production very early on too because of the way we all work together um is intrinsic to choices color choices i mean with the gold it's you know which is why he's got it behind him i think was it his idea I, i'll claim <laughs> it no not at all <laughs> but i um yeah i i i'll be involved i mean i was sent a script alon who's one of the producers is a friend of mine anyway so and we worked together for a while um, but then with, with Rob, we'll do camera and lens tests. Um, and I think we probably tested every camera again, didn't we, Rob? I think yeah. like we, we, we always do and see if there's surprises and lots of different lens sets. I had to grade those actually at Filmlight who make the base light because I wasn't yet at Warner Brothers where I was going to do the project. I was at the previous company, so that was a little bit odd. But then we did lots of lens tests and then hair and makeup and then things like this. This was in three different paints and the gold leaf. And yes. I think everyone looked at it and just went, yeah, the gold leaf, even though it was probably far more expensive and, and took four months or something. Um, well, yeah, because then we, we, could only, we realized ultimately, because the, the stage was so big, we could only really afford four, four of those square gold leaf ones. <laughs> three were stolen. And one of them mysteriously ended up in Ace's place. So I don't know. This yeah, is then, it's down to, then it's down then to it, Andrew then to tile everything. And it's just a massive job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then actually, I did visit set in, um, in Manchester because there was a projected sequence that was going to be filmed and they already shot the projected. Uh, so we did three or four different grades on that, came down, 
and did some tweaking live on set. But it was great to visit set because I don't often get to. Um, took lots of references. There was a very strange crimson light on everyone's skin that freaked me out for about an hour. I was wandering around going, what, what is this? Uh, and it was just a certain frequency of light that was slightly giving it on a sunburn. That's where I saw it anyway. Um, and, then, uh, and then once Alex started editing, occasionally he'd have a panic that a sequence wouldn't work because of weather changes or various other things like the Golden Gate Bridge in the fog or the scene on top of the dam, which was, you know, in and out of sun and stuff. And, and I'd grab those scenes, grade them, and then he'd, he'd hopefully see they were gonna work. Or I'd say, well, Andrew's gotta help on this or I could possibly do that. So there's lots of back and forth and then and conversations to, to kind of solve problems for months and then finally getting to grade it all. Mm. Well, it sounds like there's a huge amount of um, instinct involved like you say and trust i mean and the, the the fact that, that that alex has got confidence in in the team and then that gives you confidence in in each other to to kind of help that process along is amazing i mean that's what it's about right yeah. so what cam what cameras and lenses did you use let's let's do that question cameras and lenses question uh, on, <laughs> well as ace said we tested everything like we always do uh, because it's it's always one of those things, but that you know, I was I would say rather pretentiously, the movie presents itself in the test room, uh, and, and it's the combination of whatever that camera is and whatever those that lens combination becomes, it suddenly arrives, and and so that's how we that's how we do it. Um, we ended up with the the Venice Sony Venice, um, uh, and we were using C series animal foot glass with some E-series lenses to make up the rest of the set because we have two cameras, sometimes three. Um, and then in addition to that, we were using what we call H-series, or what, what Dan Sazaki and Woodland Hills calls H-series H lenses, which were essentially C-series glass, but um, the sort of predecessor to that in, in, in spherical mode. Uh, the reason I ended up using those was mainly because we knew we'd need to carry something that would accommodate the sheer scale of, of the Devs Cube set itself once we got to Manchester. Um, even with our widest anamorphic, it, it would, you know, you, you'd feel the bend and it wasn't quite right. It wasn't really what we were looking for. Uh, and the, the, I mean, the, the reason for that glass, the reason for C-series glass was, um, it's, for me, it's just sort of like, the, the, it's smoky, it's elegant, it's classic. And um, there's something that sort of happens with the, those layers of glass and the way in which I light, uh, and there's sort of a reaction that I, I enjoy, I really enjoy, and it feels sort of, you know, it, it feels true to, to to what my eye is seeing. Um, we what we had to do was <laughs> we had to expand the glass because the remit, the original remit, was to shoot like sixteen nine. Um, for FX, but then we we felt that we wanted to just push it a bit and go a little wider, and so we all agreed on, on a two to one ratio. We felt that like two three five was too self conscious, and, and it didn't really need that. The story already had that kind of scale anyway, so we, we didn't need to sort of airbrush cinema onto it in a way. Um, so we, we so we we were using a two to one ratio, which meant once we'd expanded those lenses, it pushed those aberrations just out to the edges a little. So it didn't make it uh, as, um, you know, you know, it, it wasn't sort of in your face because the Sony sensor is very sharp to so pick up on every single detail as well. Another thing I quite like. Um, so yeah, it, ultimately it, that was that was how it went. I think. Right. So you used the anamorphic, oh. but then you but 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 tried to just watching the, the the sort of more strident of the effects as you managed to push those out. That's it, and then and then your your drop off was suddenly became slightly more pronounced and really interesting because things with the you know the texture of the gold that's behind Acer right now, um, the reflections, the glass, the distance, the scale, all of those things would then kind of create you know beautiful layering, a beautiful texture. I mean, some of the stuff that that those gold walls did mm -hmm. once we got the light onto it and we started with our patterns, our shifting patterns, uh, it was just off the scale. Kind of crazy really i mean some of the things that would happen even whilst we were shooting you know we'd be doing a close-up on nick or something 
uh, in week five uh, of, of six weeks on the dev set and it, it continued to offer up new things. And there we are looking at close and Alex is just like, I've seen this, this is insane. Look what's happening behind him. And we would just be watching what's happening behind Nick. They're not really paying much attention to what he was doing in close up, which was extraordinary in itself. And we're just like, look at the background, man. It was, you know, it, it still, it just continued to surprise us that whole setup. So those lenses, that camera, the sets, everything, it, it, you know, it, it seemed to work. Um, it had a, a super yeah. strong, confident, uh, uh, low con kind of textured uh, look that was for, that stayed pretty consistent throughout the whole thing. How much was um, how much was Alex involved in in the making decisions about that look, or, or even about lens choices? I mean, do you offer stuff to him? But does he get yeah, to I mean, play in that? Absolutely, one hundred percent. We when we when we do the tests, you know it always relay back to Alex. Look, there are, there are three really good candidates for this and I think you're going to enjoy this. And I would constantly be in contact with him and just say, look, this is what I think, this is what I feel, but I would offer up options. Uh, and, and it would be, you know, what are, what are the strengths and weaknesses of these choices? And we'd discuss it. Um, Asa was there, Andrew was there, and we'd all take a look together. Uh, in, in, the, in the grading suite and we'd probably ultimately come to a joint decision essentially because everybody had you know it's just again it's about reacting to something uh, using your gut to react to it and we'd all just be in the room and we'd go we like that one you know let's, let's do that uh, <laughs> because because it, it just felt right it felt right for what we were doing mm. um, Andrew how much does um these days, I mean, was there, was there any was there any uh, pressure from uh, from FX or from anyone about uh, about resolution? First of all, because obviously there's some people have streaming requirements. Was there any well, of that? We, we knew it was going to be a 4K show, um, so that that was always going to be the, the delivery format. Um, and then, but I mean, really, with the with with the lens choices. It, it's, it's, it's as Rob says, it's about what you feel when you see it. And I mean, I remember when we, when we looked at the camera test um, in, the, in the grading suite with ASIN, we were quite lucky. And, and it, I know that working with oldish anamorphic glass is harder work for visual effects because there are more optical quirks and things that we have to handle and take care of it. But you just look at a close up of someone shot on the sort of 65 mil on the C series and you say, I've got to use it. I mean, look at it. It's ridiculous. And um, so it, it, then after that, the sort of the resolution question is less of a, an issue because, you know, the glass resolves what the glass resolves. And by going from 2K to 4K, you get more interesting texture, but with, you're not, it's not like using a sort of super modern set of razor sharp spherical lenses. Like you're not suddenly going to read all the license plates in the back of the shot. You know, it's like the quality is basically inherent in, in the glass and the sensor. And whatever resolution you end up choosing after that, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it matters a lot less than it would have a lens choice and think something different. Um, but it was interesting with these H series having that extra clarity because the psychological, for me, jump from all of this sort of very beautiful, soft anamorphic imagery that's very human. And then you're in, the only times really we're using, you're using the spherical lenses was inside this vacuum seal in this utterly rectilinear environment. And it just gives it that extra push into something other that was a real treat. And it's like, I mean, I remember, you know, every time on set when I was you know, lurking over your shoulder watching the monitors are shooting stuff like this. Great. I mean it's just great. Look at this. I mean it already looks fantastic. So we're gonna have to really screw up pretty badly to make this <laughs> look bad, you know. And that's what you that's what you hope for. Mm. Did you have to do anything to the to the sphericals to make them to to yeah, match them back? A little bit of um, just slightly warping the edges out of it so you get a little bit of a sense of stretch to slightly um give it a bit, not an anamorphic 
feel, but just to slightly take it away from that super hard edge, very uh, foreshortened look that we were getting on. Because with the cube, essentially, often we would end up looking uh, taller and thinner than a cube. Um, so we were just pulling things out a little bit, just so visually it felt true to our world. Um, what have you? What digitally? What have you? What camera did you use on uh, on um, on X Machina and Annihilation? Is it the yeah. Um, it was another Sony camera. Yeah, it was another Sony on the on the on a X Machina. We ended up using the F sixty five, which you know at the time was 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 the large format camera. Although we, we weren't really the camera didn't really enable you to to use the, its sensor to its full capacity. Uh, it was almost like the sensor was ahead of uh, ahead of the body itself, but the um, the tech again the texture of it and the way it looked the way it responded to the light it just felt to my eye it just felt right um, and again we tested everything we always test other cameras too so we ended up in that place um, similarly with annihilation we actually switched we we moved through camera systems and lens systems uh, to follow the narrative of the story. So those things would shift. So we started in a place where we almost left off with Ex Machina and, and moved into, you know, we were in a world of uh, Primo Anamorphics and F65s. And then we ended up with, with Reds and G Series. So it's a, it kind of followed a pattern, a narrative pattern with that particular film. Um, now with, 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 the, with the new Sony camera at this end on devs, I think one of the, one of the other reasons that we enjoyed or thought it would work very well from this apart from the fantastic look was um it's obviously very compact but you have this rialto system so you can you know remove the sensor and just have it as a lens and we ended up using because because of the nature of a lot of the scenes which which uh, a, a lot of the reason why it was quite similar to ex machina so a lot of those scenes particularly in the dev, devs cube would be very long dialogue scenes so sometimes eight nine pages of dialogue um so we had we had the the set um, the floor of the set designed in such a way that we could we could use the dolly as a dance you know as a dance floor mechanism and rather than me being kind of wrapped around the dolly the whole time we we decided that we would try and use uh, stable eye as a as a sort of remote head because we were looking for something very very quiet and it was the quietest we could find uh, but then it also meant that um, you know we, we could then make very quick decisions Dur during these scenes. Um, I'd be on comms to to uh, Sam Phillips, who's pushing the dolly or, or one of his other guys. And um, we could we could maneuver the way, you know, we could we could trace trace the scene uh, and change, make very, very quick decisions very, very quickly, uh, at finite changes uh, whilst we're shooting, which was fantastic. Um, so, so that was a really useful thing from the, from the camera point of view. It meant that we were never switching cameras because we always had the same thing. Um, and then I think also later on, when there was a sort of guerrilla team that went back to San Francisco to do a number of G, GVs there, we ended up using the, A7, uh, the A7S with those H-series lenses. So it's this, again, it's still in that kind of Sony sense of the world. Um, but what were you after for that then? Is it were they shooting plates or I mean, the, or because that's your, or were you using the ISO for that? Because it's got crazy ISO, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was a combination of things really. It was. It was just to you know, just gather more material because when we were there for the two months that we were there, I mean, for the majority of that time we were in Santa Cruz, and so when we did finally get to San Francisco to to shoot the streets there, obviously we had a lot to do. So. Um, Andrew went off with a with a second unit and uh, brought some wonderful stuff back to us, and then we just discovered, you know, Alice just discovered in the cutting room, we just need more, we just need more of it. Um, and rather than go back with a big team, we kind of devised this like guerrilla style, um, you know, on the hoof camera package, and um, used that. It worked a treat. You mentioned um, set design and how you had it built for, uh, you know, to uh, where it was a lot of it was dance floor. So it was kind of 
uh, grip friendly. But you also mentioned about lighting being uh, 360. Um, yeah. How did, well, there's a couple of things with that. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, uh, I mean, how do them, how much influence then do you have over blocking in terms of making shape for, for, um, for lighting on cast, you know, does, uh, and is Alex sensitive to that or do you, you know, so, shoot yeah, that's, that or? that's a really good question because I think coming back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, that the amount of prep that we put in to make those spaces, uh, as 360 degrees as possible, and that includes everything. I mean, that's like design, lighting, everything, camera maneuverability. It, what it does is it means that, and, and in particular with the dev set itself, is that when you walk onto that set morning, uh, there's a scene, and we're looking at that scene, those pages, and, and uh, we could make a decision about doing it over there, over there, or uh, let's not do it anywhere near here at all. Let's, let's, let's put the whole scene against that window. Or we can make those decisions very, very quickly on the day. Um, and and it, it really helps with the narrative because it means that we're very careful not to try and repeat ourselves. And if we do, we're doing it for a specific reason. So um, you can really play, you can really develop things narratively. And it means that as far as lighting is concerned, you know, I I always prefer that method of, of allowing the actors and director to really use the space without compromising the, the look, right? So it's it, it has to then become an integral thing, which means there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of design element there. There's a lot of prep involved. Um, and it was the same with Ex Machina. We spent a long, long time rigging those sets and getting everything right so that, you know, it's like the placement of microphones in a recording studio. If you if you spend hours placing them in the right way, you're going to get the right sound, and then the band can play, and that's it. It's, it's like not that I know anything about recording studios. I don't know why I came up with that analogy, but anyway, it feels like that. That's kind of what it feels like. So, um, you know, as far as blocking was concerned, it was it was a sort of it was very much a sort of free reign. It would be give the actors you know, ideas. Uh, Alex, of course, would then have the final say and say, well, look, let's just put it here, this, this works. And, you know, he might come in one morning before everyone else and have, set, have spent a bit of time just sitting on set and then spotted something. And then as soon as I arrive, he's just like, come and look at this. Isn't this great? Uh, and we're, we're just like, we have to do something here. Let's do, let's just do this scene here. So it, you know, without, it, 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 but it didn't ever feel like, um, there was it, there were, it was made for arbitrary, those decisions were made for arbitrary reasons because it was mm -hmm. never it always had to fit the narrative. You know? um, so well, we surely did, that. Sorry, so for six weeks I didn't have uh, on that Devs Cube set we didn't have a single light. We didn't bring a single light onto the set because we didn't. It would uh, I mean apart from the fact there was so much glass everywhere it was just yeah, a yeah. night for everyone involved. But um, it was quite that was a yeah we were quite pleased about that actually. Um, Surely then, but if you're gonna, if you're you, the that it, the key with that is control, because yes. then you're gonna need to you're gonna need to have level control on yes. on, on all of those fixtures, like to a minute degree, and then yes. that's 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 your adjustment, right? Because you obviously they can't they'll turn around into a big key or you know however it is, and it would it would not be glorious. I mean, and, yes. and it is. So yes, you must have had that. Yeah, we we had that, and Lee Lee Walters, gaffer, amazing, amazing gaffer, um, would have a uh, everything back to the to the iPad. So we would work, we would walk around set together and make those adjustments, those minute adjustments. And we we would spend we spent a couple of weeks prior to that with uh, particularly with the walls, deciding about how, you know what kind of texture we want that wall at that particular moment. But it's, rather than tracing it through the entire narrative itself. We, we made a, a kind of library, if you like, of uh, which we then presented to Alex, like of different lighting states for that set. And, and any of those lighting states could then work in any combination. Um, so we had numerous things to choose from. I don't think we ever got to the end of our library because there were so many things to, to use, but um, it meant that, that no, no two days were the same. Um, Unless we were like shooting a 
you know, continuing to shoot a specific scene we hadn't finished. In fact, it, it was very much like that. Um, but also, one of the main concepts at the very, very beginning with the Debs, Debs Cube was um, the, this idea that uh, we would be using reflected light a lot. So ultimately, in its, in its purest form, we wanted the set to feel as if it's lit purely from the outside uh, ref with reflected light, no direct light at all. And then we sort of worked, we built onto that concept. I, I know you like uh, tungsten, Rob. Did yeah. you use any, any LED on this? I did. <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, I, I, I stopped entire movies with, without going there, but I did this time. Um, and um, yeah, I was just thinking yeah. about that, that amount of control and, and obviously with co colour in various bits yeah. of the lab and, and then yeah. the, and also the built in stuff feels like it was the um, built in a good stuff, opportunity. Especially. And I mean, although that said, we did, you know, we had a load of built in stuff for Ex Machina and all of it was tungsten um, and that it, it annoyed a few people, uh, but it was fine. It got hot, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was um, this time around, we, were, we really wanted to use that idea. It's like, okay, so let's embrace the, let's, what, what can we, you know, how can we get the best out of it? And one of those, one of those places is actually the, the octagonal room, hexagonal room, um, with the floor to ceiling, uh, you know, trans or white, white opaque walls. So, so we started playing with this idea of block colors, changing uh, block colors. That, that could happen very quickly, but, but the whole thing had a uniformity to it. Mm. Uh, and it was quite intense when you stood in there, very intense to the eyes. And so Lee, Lee had laid like a kilometre of LED. So I'd gone from not using LED at all. To just using suddenly, all of the LEDs. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, it went a bit nuts, but, but it, it worked really well for those, for those specific things. Um, the shoot was, I mean, it, that was good. So how, how long did you prep for? And then how long was the shoot? Oh, uh, I can't remember. Um, well, Andrew, you would have prepped for a lot long. I think uh, I was prepping for, I was already out in LA and we, I started in June and we started shooting in September, late August, September. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, w it was, um, yeah, so that long, June, July, August. Um, three months. <laughs> oh, guys, painful trying to work it out. Um, and then, of course, there's all there was all the, the chat before that, all of the dialogue before that. Um, then we took a break when we came back, like a week or so, and then we did all of the uh, apartment stuff, studio work um, at Elstree for Lily's apartment, James' apartment, that kind of stuff. New locations as well. Feeling. You know? Feeling. Ealing, not Elstree. Uh, not Elstree. Yeah. I, I wanted it to be Elstree, and uh, it became Ealing, which is equally. In fact, Ealing's lovely because it's like an old school studio. You can still smell uh, previous productions from the forties in there. It's quite nice. Um, did I bring that back? So then, uh, <laughs> from there, we went. It took a couple of weeks off, and then we went up to Manchester to Space <laughs> Space Studios, huge, huge, brand new studios up there for the for the Devs Cube. Um, <laughs> which was, that was when things really sort of took off. Got a bit crazy. In terms of that look, I want to hit that look a little bit. I mean, it, did you did you set that up from the very beginning or was it something that you just knew that you were going to do or did it come along in it, sort of uh, as you developed it and then you sort of retrograded it? To, that's not the right word, but did you, you know, was it were, were you very set on the look up front that you'd worked out with Asa or was it about... Did you capture in a certain way to know that then you were going to low con or did you low con on set or how did that work? Well, I mean, um, maybe Asa could answer that question as well. I mean, from, from, from my point of view, it's, it's again, it's like everything, you know, you, you have this idea in your mind that the look is the look um, and then it, it, it just become, it develops over time as well. So, so you're making broad stroke decisions very, very early on. You're, you're containing it and then within those broad strokes it starts to become finite after that and you move through it and different situations throw up as, you, as we all know you know different scenarios throw up 
you need different solutions for them, but but it has to work within that umbrella. Um, as far as like, you know, was there a moment where we stood <coughs> that we did we could describe the look of it? No, I think it was more um, we we sort of felt like we knew what it looked like. That, mm. it, that's the only way I can describe it. It's like we kind of knew what it looked like, uh, and we knew where we had to get to. Um, and, and yeah, but Asa, you can probably. Yeah, I think having worked on a, two previous films uh, with Alex, I, Alex likes, if he can, something neutral within the frame. Um, but quite often we might have a gold feel or, or wash or something cooler that we didn't want to lose. But there were two things that happened with this production particularly. One was we were using Venice camera, which had this extraordinary latitude. And the other thing was we were doing high dynamic range and we were doing that first. Um, and I've never used as much of the dynamic range as we did on Devs. And that slightly came a number of reasons. One was um, did an initial pass or balance to episode one and got to the night shots, which were great. Um, but I'd been influenced years ago by this book that I, I gave Rob a version of called Neon Tigers, which is uh, large format, 10 minute exposures at night of um, Kuala Lumpur and, and Hong Kong. And there was a certain quality to them that was almost daylight. Colors were strange, but there was an iridescence. And I started playing with increasing exposure and keying highlights and blooming those. Um, and it looked extraordinary, it kind of, I think it kind of gave those, instead of being establishes, it gave them their own character and showed it to Rob, Rob loved it, and then said, could we try that on some of the day material? <laughs> uh, so we did um, at various times. And there was something that we'd done in um, Annihilation, hadn't done before at all, because the normal thing you might do in a room, someone sitting on a sofa is you put a vignette on. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of DPs will go, can we close this down or concentrate on this person? It's all about that person in the room. And what we did on it on Annihilation, possibly because the women who, who had gone into the Shimmer didn't know what was going on. They'd woken up for three or four days after getting there, couldn't remember anything. And there was this whole idea then about them being slightly in the darkness and enlightenment being out of reach or just beyond them. So Rob was like, well, why don't we just ping up that little highlight there or this one, or we'd get a glow off screen or we might add a flare. And we did a similar thing with Lily in her flat. We'd grade that shot, not far off probably where it was wanted to sit anyway, but then we might just increase the glow through the window. Um, and there was a light, she was still in the darkness. So there were many passes. We probably had at least three or four days per episode and we probably had a week in the end per episode. And all eight were live all the time. So we didn't have to lock one away. That's the worst, that's the best thing now about kind of streaming services. You've pretty much got all eight or 10 there. And you're bound to discover things on episode three, four, five that you, you want to go back and try that on earlier episodes. Uh, the other thing with the high dynamic range was that the gold with the lights that Robert designed hitting it in the, in the absolute peaks on, in here were extraordinary in, in high dynamic range uh, that no one's seen yet because Hulu didn't do an HDR, BBC didn't have the rights to an HDR off FX. So either Blu-ray or if Disney Plus have it next year, um, people finally get to see that. And... So we haven't even seen the best of it yet. No, no. The HDR, honestly, the start of it before, <laughs> I think it is, which is with the red, green, blue lights on faces, which is beautiful anyway, is extraordinary in HDR. Yeah. And there's a true three-dimensional feeling to it. Even in episode one, when they're going to Debs and the bus drives along that uh, freeway, it, you, I could just watch that shot forever. And I mean, actually, that was another thing that we discovered previously on doing HDR and other shows. And I was last year we discovered it finally on season three of The Crown, which was the first one that was HDR, was that you could hold on a shot for much longer because there are now things to look at in the distance and, and things, instead of being, if it was a short shot, a bright window or light would be distracting, this was something to explore and work on. Mm. Um, and I think that's Alex's style 
and Rob start anyways to hold on that shot, let it develop, see what happens. And Alex has been great with his editors. Barney on his previous two, who's wonderful and isn't ever panicked into cutting something up. There's no pressure from execs to get the pace going. It's just, well, if you can do it in a single or two shots, fantastic. So it's those combinations. Um, Alex and Rob, just the first thing was they just said, we want it to look cinematic. Um, and it, it pretty much oh. did. I mean, those lens choices and the design and everything else. Yeah, make it look good. It'd make yeah. it look good. Um, <laughs> but there were, I mean, you know, there were just, there were times, there were scenes we did several times. The dam on the, on the you know, the scene on the dam was tricky with, with, with you know, sunlight changing and flares from different angles. We added some flares to those. What was great on visual effects with Andrew is Andrew is not at all precious that the grade that we're doing has to match the offline. And, and some visual effects supervisors are, are very much married to that and get worried. But I'd, he'd be the first one to say, try this, try that. And then I would also say, well, I could do this, but I think it's breaking. Can you? And then he'd say, great, we will do whatever that thing was, adding stars or a flare or whatever it might be. Uh, which has been brilliant over two or three films to be able to go, well, I can I can do it in the grade and it might be fine, but if it's not, you guys are going to have to help me out on this one. Mm. Um, That's great that you've got that channel backwards and forwards because often, yeah. often you, you might yeah. get stuff that kind of comes from VFX that's almost pre-graded or he's not, yeah. almost doesn't sit in the world. Well, that's exactly the thing is Andrew and Alex would in include Rob all the way through. I've been doing productions recently where unfortunately um, some of that visual effects is just being done and, and I'm like... This is the first time in the grade now that the director of photography has ever seen that shot, that shot of London or that alien or wherever it might be. And they're going, what's going on with the lens choice and the lighting and everything? So mm -hmm. you have to include your DP all the way through. I think some productions go, thanks for filming it. And then it's on to the next, which is just, which is not right. Um, so yeah, that going back and forth, particularly as we hosted all the visual effects reviews because we had HDR monitors and we just, in previous experience on other films we would often find that things were clipping or you could see cranes through lights through windows or various problems and, and it was brilliant having Andrew and his team in reviewing spotting any problems and you know so that we just never had to sort of hide anything or or, or fix it um, right. it was a it's a brilliant process doing it there. Yeah. Right. Did, you HDR, did, did you HDR monitor on set Rob? Uh, I don't recall we did actually. Um, because that's becoming more of a standard now, isn't it? Yeah, it's more of a standard. In fact, the first time I was really introduced to that was after Devs, uh, mm. doing some pre production work on another production. Mm. Uh, it was the first time that had been brought in, so no. Um, but by, by that point, of course, we you know, spent so much time in the room with it. And as Asa was saying, it's it is extraordinary. I mean, it does, it three-dimensionalizes things in a way which is not untrue to, to the material at all. It just, you know, you're feeling it like you're in the room. It's like, it puts you in the room and it's fantastic mm. for that reason. And also just to add to um, that process in post where, you know, we would all basically have access to each other and, and that dialogue would continue in the same way that it started in, in pre-production. Uh, I mean, often, it, it, you know, on a couple of occasions, we Acer and I might be working on something, and we might find that there there are two shots that aren't quite, you know, they're just not working together. Uh, the, the decisions that have been made editorially, um, and these these things specifically, things like um, the aerials, because there was a lot of excellent excellent work in those aerials that we just wanted to mine it and get the right, make sure we had everything right and. Uh, a couple of occasions we would be looking at some shots that we cut together and we were just like, it's not quite something about if it was just a few frames or if it was not, you know, so, um, and then Alex would, uh, uh, Ace would just go up, talk to us. So I'd go up and talk to Alex and go to the cutting room and say, you know, do you mind if basically this is just not, it's not working. So and, come on, you know, and we would then, and then we, and, and actually on a couple of occasions, so, Good thing, really good things would come out of it because you, you would start bringing up other shots and a new sequence evolves and it just becomes better. Uh, and you know, Alex is, you know, often I say often open to that. Um, 
on occasion. On occasion. <laughs> well, I love that. I love that. I, I, I think we've talked about that before. The grade, running the edit. I love that. That's yes. my favourite thing. <laughs> That's right. We did, didn't we? Yeah. Well, I think that does actually sort of tie into the nobody being ultra precious. Yeah. yeah. And it, when when we in visual effects are, are, are putting shots together, obviously editorial will give us the sequences they've done it and say, well, this is what we think. But if, when you're putting these shots together, if you think the thing that you're adding needs to be longer or shorter, do it and show us. And if it works better, we'll change the cut. Mm. And it's the yeah. like way going back and forth. Everything is in flux, which makes it sound like chaos. And it's absolutely not that. It's just that everything is up for grabs. Everybody is trying to make it be the best thing that it can possibly be. Yeah. And nobody is going to say, well, this is going to make my life slightly difficult. So no, I'm not going to change this thing now. If you know that it is going to make it better. And that applies to everybody. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly it. It's it's everybody just wants it to be the best it can be, and and you know Alex knows that, and you know it's it's all it, it's all a question of taste ultimately. And so, if if Alex thinks it's going to make it better, then it's a you know it's a go. But but we're all it, it's the constant dialogue, which is just really good because that a lot of decisions come out of that, and a lot of new choices, new new things can happen because of that. So I'm glad that we continued that right to the end. So Andrew, just in terms of the kind of concepts for, for, for VFX and for um, uh, environments or for uh, elements, I mean, how much was, I guess it was all preconceived and was there a lot of storyboarding and was there, I mean, how much, I mean, what I want to know is about the, the, the maglev uh, entrance into the cube. I mean, how did, how was all of those things were all obviously preconceived, but did you, were you on set? How was that, how did that work? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was on set for all of that, um, always would be. Um, yes, it was, a lot of it was preconceived. We, we did some previews and we did some boards, but the way that we do them is not to be prescriptive in any way as to how things should be shot. It's much more of, of, of an exploratory thing so that before, any, before anything's been built, we can say, well, if you have a 35 mil lens on a camera inside the glass capsule and you're shooting someone who's this tall, what do you actually see? So that we can kind of get some feelings for what kind of angles are likely to work. And we can also have a look at giving them the, the restrictions of the inside of the sound stage. What angles is it going to be possible for us to get? And that then helps us know, well, okay, so Alex wants some of these sorts of establishing shots. I know before we've shot anything, they will have to be fully CG because we're not going to be able to get a camera there. Or, well, actually, we can get almost all of this in camera because we know this mixture is going to be built and so it can be framed for that. So the, 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 the prep in that regard is... Um, chucking ideas out, seeing what feels like it's going to work, um, but then on the day, shooting the thing that seems right. Um, and that's how we've always done it. And it helps me because I have an idea of, well, you know, there's probably going to be this sort of number of very tricky shots and this sort of number of less tricky shots. And, you know, and sometimes something comes out previous that everybody loves and goes, okay, well, actually, well, let's make sure we do get that because we really like it. But generally speaking, it's there as, as an aid and, as, and to give us uh, confidence before we step on set that we, in our mind's eye, have an idea of the kind of things that are going to work. Mm. But then on a daily basis, I mean, do you, it's all my favourite relationships with supervisors is when you can, you can, um, uh, you know, it's about making those decisions about stuff so it makes shooting easier. I mean, to, I mean, to, it's kind of like using grading as a tool. You know, we have to shoot for the grade because we know how to utilize that as a tool. But you then using VFX for, you know, I mean, you shot through a lot of glass. I mean, was there a lot of tidy up on stuff like that? Yeah. And is just well, that's a... mostly because Mark and me hate me. Um, and <laughs> hate me you two do not get on. So yeah. like, Andrew, how would it be if we put another glass box inside a glass box? <laughs> Great. That'd be great. Um, yeah, we've painted Rob out of quite a number of, of shots. Um, I mean, less on this because we had the stable light, which actually for us was a, a huge boon because it meant we didn't have 
operator for and first all hovering around a dolly moving shot. You, you, so in truth, we were painting out Sam Phillips in the dolly a lot, but um, it, it was better for that. Um, I mean, really on set, the, the VFX supervisor is walking that line between um, trying to make sure that we're not doing anything that slows the shoot down, um, but equally not doing anything that we know is going to absolutely screw us in post. And um, yeah. just fix it in post. Yeah, right. yeah, which is fine depending on what budget you have. Of course. Um, so uh, it, it, that, that's the line that, that you walk. Um, mm. But that's that's the job. So. Mm. I think, I think when everyone a... when everyone's when everyone says fix it in post, is it a flame artist gets their wings? Isn't that what happens? Can I, Sorry. can I just add to that, Laurie? That it's really interesting that I'd love to know from Andrew what contingency or, or, or extra percentage he thinks comes once it's all sort of cut together and finished, because I'm working on productions where we're starting on episode one. And anything comes up, they say, we haven't got any more money for visual effects. And I'm kind of like, I think you need like 20% because you've got eight or 10 episodes coming and stuff just comes up. Reflections, adding rain, flame, big effect sequences. It's like reshoots. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, that, that, sort of, that does happen. But one of the reasons why I'm always on set every day, whether it's a visual effects type day or not, is because I will watch the monitors and go, can we not, can we move that mic so that it's not in the shot so we don't have to paint it out? Can we not do it? And it's just that sort of banal stuff, which over the course of a whole series, mm. there's a whole bunch of money we haven't spent on doing stuff. Yeah. I, to be honest, don't want to do, because it's not creative, interesting work. Yeah. Got an effects budget, let's spend it on putting it all on screen in a way that makes things look fantastic. And you know, sometimes you, when you're painting out uh, you know, let's say crew, it reflected in glass. It's like, well, that's because this camera move has to be this camera move. It's the right camera move. So look, fine, we're just going to bite the bullet and we'll fix that because it's the right thing to do. And again, it's just, it's always having those conversations. Um, but I think it's, it, yeah, and it's exactly that. It's like, we, we're always supporting each other. We're always very aware of what everyone's requirements are. Um, and it, again, it all comes back to, to all of us wanting it to be the best it can be. So, so it's, it, you know, it's, we're all working hand in hand together. And I mean, Andrew being there every day is fantastic, you know, and always sketching in the book and like just... <laughs> just taking, <laughs> what he was really doing is just taking notes on everyone. I think so. It was writing um, a special report. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but, but it, it, it does, it, it really helps. And it, I think there's also a great deal of transparency as well as, as far as what we had in terms of, you know, how many shots we had that could be the effects and how many we didn't want to waste on, as Andrew says, some painting time of all of that stuff. And, and that was something that um, we were all, for the most part, aware of. Um, and, I, you know, Alex would be constantly aware of it. So if he's aware of it, we're all aware of it. And... So, so if it did, you know, I, if, if there was a, an issue or anything, I would go to Andrew and say, Look, is this going to be an issue? Is it going to be a problem? And if so, we'll, ch we'll change it. We'll do something else. We'll, we'll, we'll find a way around it. Um, before we get down that, we go too far down the path of, you know. Um, so, so I think, you know, we were very careful as much as we could be. Yeah. And obviously, if it, well, you, you have to make your days and you have yeah. to shoot at a pretty ferocious rate in order to do that. So sometimes it's going to be, we don't have time to go and you know, move this stand out of the back of shot. Now, we're not going to make our day. In which case, fine, we'll paint it out because that's, in terms of making it be the best thing it can be, in the instant, that's the right choice to make. Yeah. So two, I've just got two questions. Just to, um, to, before we, I want to look at some pictures because um, um, Andrew kindly sent me some of his prep and, and kind of recce photos, which is kind of interesting. We could look at some shots from from one of the shows. One is um, um, is HDR a problem for you, Andrew, in terms of uh, kind of hiding stuff? You know, if you if you if you if you start to increase detail and and, and you're using that stretch of latitude, um, are, is it does that present more issues for you? Um, no, because we have been working with 
floating point to effectively high dynamic range imagery for years. And all artists know to check all of their work, you know, three stops down, three stops up. Um, it's not leaving the building until that's happened. So, it, it, I mean, sometimes inevitably some things do get missed because we're only human. But 95% of that is caught before it leaves the visual effects facility. And so, no, because we need to be, we need to make sure that we are offering Acer and Rob imagery that they can push wherever they need to push it. Um, and that's non-negotiable. And that's non-negotiable from my point of view because I need it. That's what I need to offer. Cool, of course. And then Rob, the other one was just about this idea of using that remote head. I mean, obviously, mm. given the situation that we're all in now and we're talking about um, uh, sets being safer and they're being slightly more remote, you know, uh, le le more con less contact and, and a bit yeah. more distance. D is, d did you feel that, I mean, I think my, one of I mean, a concern is, is that you start removing uh, the proximity of operators away from cast and then does that set up a different relationship? I mean, uh, do, do you think it's a, a, is it useful and can it, can it really work? Obviously did on this, but do you think that that relationship is important and that, that cast kind of needs somebody, yeah, you know, need an audience almost? I do think that relationship is very, very important. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, for, for many, many reasons, for obvious reasons, but because there is, again, you know, here we are talking about how we work as a, you know, as a family in a sense, it's like those casters, the cast are equally as important to that, to that process. And, you know, I mean, in this case with, with devs, we would have our cast come down, visit the set on days that they weren't shooting. They would just sit around uh, because it was, you know, they just because of the process, because there was everything else that was happening in it, you would learn something from that. And that relationship that you have as an operator, um, the response you can have when you're in the room with, with, with that actor is, is incredibly important. Um, I also think on the same token that in, you know, in the case of us using remote heads in this context, I mean, there was a necessity for it um, because of the long takes, but also because it, it allowed us, we gained so much through doing it. Uh, but at the same time, we would also have a second camera in the room as much as we could. So uh, from, a, from a sort of operating compositional point of view, um, I, I would be, I'd be on the wheels with stable eye and I would also have an image directly above the one I, I had a B camera. So, and a B camera on comms. So I could also have conversations and manage things that were happening live, if you like, which is fantastic, uh, which is something you wouldn't obviously normally be able to do. And, and an area I quite like to explore because you can get things done quite quickly. So you can move very fast, you can make quick decisions um, and without losing a sense of um, spontaneity. You can still be very, very spontaneous. And I think that, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about it. Um, that said, I, you know, when I was doing that, I, I would, I would make sure that I would go in there and be with the cast prior to the take and immediately after the take to ensure that we, there was, you know, any requirements they had, uh, if there was anything that they felt could be improved upon or whatever, you know, it, it's an important conversation to have to keep that dialogue going. So I think moving forward. We may need, you know, it's a big mystery as to how we're going to do this, but I think certainly I can see that that process being quite useful. Um, but we at least in the short term, it's something that we hopefully it's, yeah, it doesn't change term. it too much. But we also have to find a way to, to keep keep that connect between you, mm. you know between operator and, and cast member. It's so important, it really is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right, I'm just going to try and let's try and share these pictures now. Hopefully, I'm not going to crash the internet or crash my system. <coughs> these are some. Oh, hello. There we go. Let me show you this. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Excellent. Right. So uh, Andrew can talk us through some of these. These are. What 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 are these, Andrew? When 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 did you take these? Um, most of them are recce pictures from when we took. Uh, our first trip to San Francisco probably in July time, and then some of these, some of these are Santa Cruz. So some of these are um, 
ideas for general view shots that we might actually get for the series. Other ones are, I will always have a camera with me because I make images for a living. And so documenting parts of that is, is how I understand the space and how I um, you know, form that sort of relationship with an environment. Um, so yeah, so this is when just- This looks like a shot from a museum. It looks like these people are visiting a museum. This is the set though, right? Yeah, and it's, <laughs> the thing is that- the far left, it is a work of art. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Art. I mean, that quantum computer was unbelievably yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. Because, I mean, but, you know, going back to sort of talking about what needs to be visual effects and what doesn't, we had money put, put aside in the visual effects budget for you know, quantum computer enhancement, you know, pleasantly vague. Didn't need it. Yeah. So, <laughs> funny. Like, right, good. Well, we can spend that money somewhere else, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, so sort of moments like this, when you walk onto a set like this, this is absolutely one of, you know, in the top five, top three sets I've ever walked onto. Mm. It's just gorgeous. Everywhere you look, you go, well, this looks amazing. Oh, that looks amazing. Oh, and if I look through the thing that looks amazing at this other amazing thing, it's just crazy. Um, so that was the, you know, the, the, the joy of for someone like me is, when I'm walking around with a camera, I'm I'm exploring the space so I can try and understand it. And sometimes I'll shoot something that I think might be useful to to Rob or to Alex. And so I, you know, if some evenings they might get an email with a couple of image attachments and go, saw this, don't know if this is any use to you or not. But you know, there you go. Um, well, says uh, first AD to the stars, Matthew Penry Davy there. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that's Marco in the foreground. Right. And this is the this is in the um, visualization room, right? Yeah. So, so the, the, the 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 projection that was used in there was that a live? You, was that? A, a, I'm guessing that was a rear projection because there's that time when um, when it suddenly comes online in Ep Seven when there's with the one second buffer. I mean, how how was how was that done? Was that a pre-record or what was that? A, how did that work? Um, we no, it was shot. We put a camera stripped down as much as we could on a bazooka with wide lens, right next to the screen, looking back into the room, and that's what we used to create the reflection. And then um, uh, Rob and Alex just shot it as they wanted to, got their angles as they wanted, and then we painted out that camera and then took the contents of that camera and put it on the screen with the time offset based on how Jake and, and uh, Steve Pang had put it together in the edit. Mm. It was one of those things that reads in an absolutely terrifying way, but actually <laughs> wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that was actually easier than I thought it was going to be. So, <laughs> anyway, so it's nice when it does that. This looks like San Francisco, is it? Is this with that, with that mist? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of it's already starting to feel like the show, you know, with that sort of muted, diffused sunlight and then mm. the fog. It's already, uh, it's already coming through there. It's incredible light there. It really yeah. is. Beautiful. Which where where was this? This That's was this where you, where yeah. where you shot. Yeah, so this is Santa Cruz. This is University of California, Santa Cruz, which is this amazing brutalist uh, campus, literally in the middle of a redwood forest. Mm. Uh, this is the Russian meeting, right? For the, uh, the supposed to be at the foot of the, is it the foot of the bridge? Is that where? It is? Yeah. Beautiful. This is all starting to this brutalist thing in the middle of a forest is starting to feel a bit ex machina. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> oh, hello, I'm skipping. on, it's processing. That is a piece of work. I mean, where's that gone? Has that been? Is that ended up in the Smithsonian or something? It's a. That's in my spare room as well. Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not. I don't know where they is did, that. Uh, I think it's in was, storage. Yeah, there was talk about putting it. Um, Sending it to science museum or somewhere. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I think ultimately that might still be the plan. But I think obviously they want to keep hold of all of the various assets that might have reused. 
It is beautiful. But this is of course, I mean, it, of course it works, you know. I mean, it, it, who... <laughs> this is the other thing, the reason for me going around taking photos is that this this is after Rob and Lee have lit it, and I'm sort of walking around going, Well, this looks great, and this looks great, and this looks great. And so you know, it helps me, you know, my, my, my confidence levels are now sky high, but this is yeah. be fantastic. <laughs> So, of course, you travelled back in time, Rob. Obviously, you went back to the prehistoric age with the cave paintings and stuff, which is impressive for a production. Uh, well, uh, you know, so <laughs> that's prepared for, for our location work. I mean, we did you know, 30,000 years of it back. Um, right. We had to wear hard hats. Um, <laughs> safety, when first. Go to the safety first in time travel. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that shot? This is up in uh, Lancashire. Oh, really? Yeah, it's near Ambleside. Um, Exotic realms of... Uh, of uh... So did you light that? Is that a lamp up there? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, yes and no. I mean, we did. There were, so, there were a number of restrictions on this location. Um, and, you know, we, we were really, really pushing for the idea of natural light anyway. Um, which obviously gave us a number of restrictions in terms of shooting time, but there was a there was a sort of sense that well, look, we're going to use fire. That's what we want to use. Um, you have this extraordinary, beautifully beautiful, soft, natural light that's coming through this uh, rather convenient gaping hole in the sea, and uh, it, it you know it, it worked well for us. For the for the most part, I mean, we we tried we put some lamps up there, but it, it was just. Um, it was, very, it was a very difficult thing as far as safety was concerned, actually, mm. in the end, because uh, there was a whole thing you had to do, climb around the outside and up, a, up, up some quite steep um, cliff edges to get into that position. Um, yeah, but it was, it was an extraordinary space, it really was. Mm. I mean, look, if you look at it, it's just like, you know, the natural light is doing this. It's like, why yeah. do anything else? Hang on. I'm going to go back to that because that's rather beautiful. Is it going to do it? Oh, there it is. It might have been past it. That is beautiful. I mean, you couldn't build that, could you? Well, no. And, it, you know, and you've got, you've got some lovely, it's, the colours come through and it's, mm. it's just beautiful. Mm. That kind of soft north light. So we're getting into a bit of gold here. Yeah, we, we spent... We spent quite a while, fairly early on in the grade, deciding exactly what colour gold would be. Yeah. Um, and then went through and did a gold pass on all eight episodes. But because, <laughs> it, you know, it can wander and, it, it, and there's a lot of it and it can look a bit pink or it can look a bit green. So, mm. yeah. It's... So I think there's a shot somewhere, Rob, of the rig. Uh, and it was... It was um... Was it largely tungsten that was that you had in um, in kind of nine lights or stage blinding, you know, that, that, so that running yeah. all around outside, and so you could that's how you could run the pattern in the kind of yeah. the, you know the processing kind of pattern. That's right. Yeah. So we, so we yeah we had um, nine lights running across the top and bottom of the set itself, the cube it, itself, um, and then we also had them along the top and bottom of the of the gold wall as well and this is the room yeah this is the, this room, is the glass room right yeah yeah uh, and again i mean it was just instant the things you could do the shape look at that i mean you just there were so many things that would offer themselves up once we mm. decided once we created that sort of library of texture and we, we would have to really find that texture on the wall and mm. once we did it was all sorts of things would happen we we were worried that you know in the first week of shooting on devs on the cubic set itself that we would we would use everything in the first week you know um, but at, it transpired that, that we you know we would find something we would find a look day three or four like, oh my god this is amazing let's just do this now and and Alex would be like let's save it for let's try it week two you know we're, we're here for a while don't worry so we'll get to it <laughs> um, and often we would but there were still things at the end that were happening. You know, week five we were doing was just uh, extraordinary. This place is oh. great. I just oh. wanted this is I did a, I did do some but I can't guarantee these are terribly good. These are pulls from 
off of iPlayer just conveniently, but just um, but this is um, some so beautiful. these Laurie, Laurie, these in HDR are. I can imagine. I mean, I wanted to just grade more landscapes. I kept asking for more, but I think there are only three <laughs> shots in the end. Um, there's probably ten or eight or ten layers of power windows on these. Mm. And it, yeah. you know, just try things, just find a little bit of sunlight on a distant hill and brighten mm. it and darken a corn. And it just, this was one of the things we also found with the aerials over San Francisco with the Venice was the latitude was extraordinary. And we, at one stage, I did them all gold, another stage, they were all cool, and they all worked, nothing fell apart. So we, we like Rob said, Alex would say, we'll keep going until it breaks and we'll come back and we'll try something else and um yeah those landscapes really are just stunning anyway but you could just grade them and these oh, mm. i mean that, that was another thing you talked about earlier about what what alex and rob were talking about in the early stages one was this beautiful soft contrast flary look that rob delivers and then just anchoring it with a black again somewhere in the frame so there was some weight to it you know sure. it's, it's not only there had to be it a, Strange, interesting, interesting looking at compositionally as well because there was a there was always this thing that we want to find a connection between so so you could, you know you can shoot any given landscape but it, it feels like it could connect to any given interior yeah. or any landscape anywhere else um, and and you know we we would always come back to that word inexorable we'd always want it to feel like there's a there is a specific viewpoint. Um, that's that's often that we're often have difficulty in describing uh, but once you've found it you framed it you knew that, that, that this image would relate to the image the previous image and the next image um irrespective of what the content of that image is does that mm. make sense uh, yeah a little bit. it does well it's about consistency isn't it i guess and it's that yeah. uh, uh, and the compositional strength across the whole show and the fact that there's um you know there's a narrative to the composition rather than it just being of um a, a collection of, uh, of 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 what wides mediums and closes just to make yeah. a, make an edit i mean the coverage the coverage was so spare and but uh, um and and lean but strong you know all the storytelling was done not without without it being you know cut into which i think is the, that's that's it's one of its strengths completely and i mean that comes from from alex i guess or did you shoot shoot it to death and then he cuts it all elegantly afterwards uh no we were we were um you know we, it, it, it was just one of those things where we would we just get we're excitable right so we we, we see things and you know when i when i'm out or we're on location wherever there was there's always there's always a there's always an image that presents itself const constantly, constantly, and you just, you know, you want to get it. And um, mm. so it, it was just a question of finding the time to do all of these things. Um, so in, in that sense, yeah, we would shoot the shit out of it, but but it, there was never, it never felt like we were shooting anything arbitrary. And if we did, mm. you know, we would both sort of not bother shooting it. We would put the camera up and we go, no, this just doesn't, no, let's not bother. Let's get, we can do better, better than this, you know. Um, and again, it, it would just come back to that idea of, you know, this is what, this is the feel of the world that we're in, we're inhabiting. And, um, you immediately know if an image doesn't fit that world that went whilst you're, whilst you're making it rather than shoot everything and hope it all works in the edit. Um, we were, we were much more considered, I suppose, but, but with, with a, a sense of spontaneity that, that sort of contradicts itself in a way, but we were you know, being spontaneously considerate. Considerate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it works. I mean, but it does take, like, again, comes back to that kind of instinct and trust, doesn't it? Of yeah. That kind of, uh, of being able to operate like that and to be able to almost look at each other and go, you know, what, where does this shot go? You know, whether it fits yeah. or not. Yeah, and uh, not just into a scene, but into like you say, into, across the whole the, the whole narrative. Andrew, there was there's a there's a, a couple of these throughout the series of that kind of um, uh, um, almost motion control stuff. I mean, was there was, uh, was actually motion control? Uh, well, no, but that kind of idea of be, yes. because the camera's always moving, isn't it? I think it, there's always that um, 
the majority of times that I noticed that there's just even if it's really te teeny tiny, there's always mm. a there's some camera movement going on. Um, but so it, 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 did, did this sort of stuff present problems at all if you weren't doing motion control? Just... Uh, if we, these would be very difficult to do without motion control for sure. Mm. Um, but because of, we were able to schedule the shoot in a way that the, the Monaco stuff would happen at the appropriate times, we, we were able to get everything that we needed to um, Moco. Because again, also in the case of something like this, to be blunt, it becomes a budgetary concern that it's cheaper to spend the money and shoot it with Moco um, rather than having a much more expensive visual effects shot trying to rebuild everything afterwards. Mm. Um, but I guess um, the small the small moves might have helped because you weren't doing the enormous parallaxing <laughs> shifts. <laughs> uh, I mean, did, was was any of that camera movement was that ever posted? I mean, was it ever DVE'd or was it what was it all in camera? Um, it was all in camera, I think. All in camera. It's, all, it, it's... yeah, all in camera. So yeah, we would with those with those specific shots, we would. Um, yeah, it was all cam all in camera. It took a while, but um, you know, we would we would frame up, we would run the shot until we found a version we liked, and then that would become the version. And then um, after that, it was you know, it was a good couple of hours of working through the content with the shot, obviously repeating itself. Of course, this is that uh, the uh, one second delay. And they've, it finally comes online. So where was the, you had a camera in shot, did you? So you had the, how did that work? Flat bang, where, where on the screen where you can see Stephen sat there right. was a camera with a 14 mil lens, 15 mil lens. Right. Yes. Pointing back. Um, and I mean, the thing with the sort of the conceit with this though is that uh, we're cheating in as far as it shouldn't be a mirror. Um, you know, if you actually ha are having a vision of this other world, it should be the other way around. But we mm. tried that, and it just screws with people's heads far too much. <laughs> Basically, no one questions. Even more it than it did. Wow. It, wrong. Um, <laughs> it couldn't handle reality. Exactly. Um, and so it just makes so much more sense to just say, uh, it's, it's flop. And that's the reasons of quantum physics that are mm. very complicated. Yes. <laughs> you don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> can I can I ask a quick question of um, Rob and Andrew? When you were shooting the plates for the statue of the girl, which is a couple of hundred feet high, was there any previous 3D in camera work, or was it just guessing how high to to tilt the camera? And... Uh, option two. <laughs> it was option two, actually. We, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we were just. It would just be, you know, is this. You know, should we just let's tilt up, and it would be like, well, you're not far enough, and um, and then you mean this far? No, a bit. For, you mean this far? <laughs> <laughs> Very scientific. Okay. Um, okay. Well, and also, we 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 would cheat the size of the statue to make it work in a particular shot. So right, you know, she nominally is 200 feet tall. She bears a bit. Right, mm. right. For reasons of compositional purity. So where did you build this? <laughs> I mean, some some budget that. To uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm well, guessing that's that's a that's a plate that you painted in, is it, Andrew? Um, that is uh, a drone plate, um, and on set on on, uh, on location we have the doorway, right? Uh, and then the facade of the building we have blue screen up to about a meter high running the full length, uh, sorry, the full width of the building. Um, and it meant that tech base essentially was on the footprint of where the building would end up because we knew we were always going to cover it, which made life a lot easier. Um, and we, we've got the blue screen so we can drop the grass back over the front of the building when we put it in. Uh, but yeah, it's a, that's a fully CG building. Um, and that actually changed during post-production so when we were filming it the original design was a much simpler shape that had these large tiles on the front of it that were sort of going to gently move and have patterns written in the top of it. Um, and then it was sort of one of those halfway through post getting a phone call from Alex going I think we need to radically change this and he goes oh okay 
Uh, and of course, the big flashing dev sign. It was not. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah that went. That, that, went. that did have to go. Yeah. Um, so that got redesigned and posted. Um, so these these house interiors, they these were all uh, stages. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, they were. Uh, these were the ones that were not at Elstree. They were at Ealing. Not at Elstree. Yeah, these are the ones that these were the ones that were not at Elstree. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, and I just I grabbed this. Obviously, this is uh, because obviously you did a there's a, a um, of having that live exterior with Alison going out there. Yes, yeah, uh, and it, you know, a really, really fantastic match mm. by Marco and Mish. Um, this tiny little, little that we found in Santa Cruz, not far from the campus. Mm. Um, you know, very very nice little suburban on a suburban street. Uh, and then, yeah, then we instruct me into the baby font of the be Also, uh, not at L Street, at um, Ealing Studios. <laughs> Ealing, apparently. <laughs> yeah, L Lily's apartment. Um, so I mean, this was, good, this was a, jet, a gift with that, with the, the, um, the, the, you know, the big softbox along one wall, really. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you I mean, it's literally the design comes down to that because it's, it's sort of sensitive to you know working with with, uh, with Mark and Michelle is that that's what yeah 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 in many respects and and you know often of course of course we would have these conversations but sometimes you know um, there would be some pleasant surprises and, uh, specifically with this we spent a lot of time. You know, <laughs> discussing about it, it, a lot of this stuff was very much about what it was like outside and how um, degree, the degrees of life that we require, times of day, all that kind of stuff. And I, ha I had to make decisions very, you know, we had to make changes very quickly. So again, everything was pre rigged. A lot of this was tungsten mixed with, you know, warm tungsten mixed um, the tungsten that was that was cooled also. So I had, so I could get that that nice sort of you know polluted mix, uh, light mix that sort of late afternoon light mix. Um, was that a was that a um, was that a green screen out there or did you have a translite? There was a there was a translite of sorts, uh, which I think at this a, point, a soft drop. Yeah, at this we, yeah because and it wasn't so, it wasn't as far back as we would like would have liked it to have been. Um, uh, but yeah, I remember at this point it was very much like, well, this is sorry, there's no money left. This is what we've got. Uh, but actually, it worked quite well. So it just meant, you know, it just meant we had to try a bit harder. And uh, there's a couple of grips outside with trees on wheels. Trees on wheels. Andrew, but Andrew helped us here. Yeah, there's bit, there's bits of this where we we've added a little bit here and there. Um, on a, on a lot of these, um, but I think the other thing that I, I just wanted to say about all these interiors, uh, and it's not what I was expecting, but the the HDR of these interiors is sensational. Mm. The, the the richness and the depth that you get with this beautiful soft lighting is absolutely amazing. You sort of expect all of the big vistas to look great, which they do. But it, the ones that really surprised me are going, oh, wow, that's gorgeous. With, with shots like this sort of thing, it was just phenomenal. Uh, these these shots, these grabs are all, they're in kind of story order slightly, but um, they're, not, mm. they're not location. What I wanted to ask here was about your, the, what comes along eventually anyway, is the crane move. Mm. Says when Linton, Lyndon is falling, it's, um, which is that kind of whether that's motion control or whether you worked on a shortened version of it because it sort of comes up as a, a series of it somewhere. And obviously you've, you're out off of the side. So I guess so, there was a telescopic on this. Wasn't there? Yes. Yes. Here, here we had a telescopic on location um, so that we could, you know, cover the dialogue, the dialogue part of the scene and the entrance and exits. And then um, we, for the for the fall itself, the actual fall when you return to it, we have we filmed the top part of that fall. Uh, funnily enough, in uh, wasn't on this location; it was on a different location. 
and uh, a, a few months later. Right, right. And then Andrew extended the first part of it. So we, so it's a handover essentially from yeah. Andrew into, into what we did for real. Mm-hmm. To Alison then walking on. Yes. This one this I've pick, picked for its uh, its lens effect. Yes, you can see there again. All all, all this is location work. Um, everything in this frame is real. We've got, except that's obviously a double that's not really Katie going over the edge there. Um, Beautiful spot, and then this was the one. So this was the sequence. So I'm, pa- I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing them as it as it travels up for each of them. That's right. That's so that so, is, that's a CG environment there, and it's we, we transition into most control that we shot, right? Uh, not at the dam later. Um, so it's yeah, so it's partial set build, but m- mostly it's a CG environment. I think I took so we shot place. this this element here. This was shot a few months later in the car park of Space Studios in January uh, in Manchester. Mm-hmm. So you can see, yeah, yeah. freezing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she had a very red nose at one stage. It's yeah. the, <laughs> it's not the balmy really? autumn that it was. Yeah, it wasn't the beautiful <laughs> late summer sun of California yeah. anymore. No. <laughs> And then we're inside, or oh, not this one, sorry, it's, it's still a bit of. Uh, oh, yeah. there he, he's been. Oh, there. I was just. Um, oh, so here we go. So that's just an interesting. So this was, it was again, that was the same setup, was it, Andrew, in terms of the, you know, the, real, the real doorway and then that set extension? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And the, the gold columns are almost all real there, I think. Right. But you know, all of those are real. Right. Uh, I mean, this is some set, isn't it? It's yeah, amazing. it's extraordinary. Well, I took a couple of those because of, of lighting changes, obviously, with the, the uh, again, with that, with the, the, the processing pattern. Yeah, and how that changes it is pretty. So yes, the maglev lift. Yeah, the the, uh, the drawbridge. How did that work? Uh, the 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 lift is real, but it is on a enormous steel dolly that is being pushed by six grips. Right. <laughs> okay. And then the idea, obviously, I, mean, I love this shot actually because it's it's kind of it's almost throwaway, and it's one of the hardest ones to do because you're shooting through multiple layers of glass so we have to strip out all of the real reflections put the right. background in then put the reflections back over the top but it, well, it, i tried to take there was the sequence so that's the beginning it, that it pans yeah. in, in in real it's impressive but it, but it's but what i love about it is that it, it it's not a shouting or oh, look it's a visual effect shot visual effect shot it's it, it, it just feels like <coughs> part of the world and that's what i love well, it's all, it's, I mean, it, it feels like it's on the, on, on the dolly, I guess. I don't, was there any we would have seen there? It feels pretty practical, doesn't it? I yeah, guess this, have, this, again, this, probably, it this would have been um, probably on the stable line. So again, to keep mm. the footprint down, to minimise any kind of reflections. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, conceptually, the shot, we like the idea that it feels as if you're just, you're outside of the building, but actually not if you're inside. And as Andrew says, it, it's it's sort of you know it, we didn't run it when it's really sort of break too hard on it. It's kind of throwaway, but but just love the idea of, of this it, you know in, exterior to interior kind of move. Mm-hmm. It's very casual, and also it sort of reflects the way Alison moves because her movements are fantastic. Her character's movements are fantastic. So there's a sort of <laughs> foreboding element to it. Well, it's lovely. It's the, 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 I find it's those little, the simplest convincers of the effect. It doesn't need to be super showy. It's just those little things that just normalise it. 
which is always really I think is almost more beautiful rather than being too like you say is that sort of showboatness of it. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Again, I was just I was grabbing it for kind of um, for lens effects and the diffusion and how that's worked for you know these are not that kind of the what that kind of um, they're not kind of HDR held highlights there's still well, that, tone, that tonal difference but well there, there were two things Laurie that that we did with with those in in the base light we've got a great tool they built it's called um texture highlight and what it does is it will diffuse highlights and you can work with a roll off but specifically when you have things in HD that look really horrible like pinpricks of light at a thousand nits or mm. fire those things you can just use that texture highlight to soften or bloom out without having to take down highlights as a you know in a curve or any other way. Mm. The other thing on these was we added a very small amount of anamorphic diffusion to everything. Right. So that you know there's almost all of it, you know, 98% is probably in the lenses, but the just a tiny bit more, which helped any highlight bleed slightly across a foreground, which is nice for visual effects. Not that Andrew needs any help with visual effects sitting in, but it does just help that extra layer as if everything mm. was, was shot in camera. Um, I mean, in, in terms of brain structure, this is obviously, it's not a, not a great example because it's it's from, from uh, our friends at iPlayer, but it's, uh, I mean, was there, I, I mean, I don't know if Rob, you've talked about not one, did you want any of that granularity of, of, of using texture with with grain or was it not that was not not really i mean it's not something i really considered to be honest with you uh the texture i i was looking for was was the way in which the glass would respond to the light and the softness mm -hmm. of the light and as Asa just said just you know aiding those things if like you know you, you just you just add that little extra two percent extra just to aid those things but that that was the sort of texture. Like this is a good example, actually. This shot is because th this this to me is all about texture um, and mood, and obviously um, the composition itself tells a story because of the this, the oddness of this situation between these two characters. So um, it it sort of has everything. It it has everything. This kind of shot um, and that texture. Yeah, the granularity. Of, again, for me that. Sometimes that feels a little, and, it, and again, it's just a question of taste, a personal thing, but it feels like I'm adding something that is not necessarily true. So there's, there's, no, there's nothing particularly honest about it. Whereas by extending, say, as Asa just said, that 2% of, you know, the flair that's already there, the, te the soft texture, enhancing, if you like, augmenting, is, is more of an honest thing to do. Uh, and and truer, truer to... What we were doing on set really um you know i i think if we're adding grain it would probably be more to do with matching into something else i imagine mm. Mm. well it's just that i guess that it, i guess you would almost expect it if you were going to stretch uh maybe if you're working in sdr but you were going to kind of stretch the uh the the contrast ratios then you might expect to start bringing up um noise possibly in in parts of it in the midtones but would you do, do, does the venice not behave like that i mean it works at very high isos as a base doesn't it yeah we we would have two modes essentially we'd have like a you know obviously day mode we'd have our split iso night mode which we sometimes used in 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 situations like this although i can't remember whether we did actually use it in this specific scene but um so we, we would find it quite useful to kind of really, because I, I like seeing into the shadows. I do, I do love all of that stuff, but, but you want, you know, there's that sweet spot, isn't there, that you're always looking for where you want the image to be, um, as Andrew said, you know, when you see, see this stuff in HDR, it's, it is really useful because, it, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm saying that because of every, with every, what everyone's done, but, but there is something very conventional about it. And, uh, it puts you on the sofa right next to Sonoya there. It does. And um, you can see, it's like the way in which the eye sees, you know, um, somehow it manages to adjust to everything, right? And 
it's what we always want without it ever wanting to feel sort of self-conscious. Mm. Um, so it's nice to see into those shadows a little without it being pushed. I wonder if it w- if 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 that would change the way well, we've talked about it before, but that kind of editorial. You, uh, I mean, the, I sh- years ago did a, a li- tiny little bit of three D work um, that was really tr- tricky and problematic and didn't wasn't necessarily very successful. But what I did find out is that editorially, you don't need hundreds of shots. It's yeah. about doing less shots that, that actually you get time to absorb because there's more to see. And you mentioned Andrew, Andrew mentioned that it's actually you, you want to just look at shots for longer because there is more there's I more think, to information in it. So would that change maybe the way that you might going forward, perhaps using HDR will change the way that you that you do coverage because actually you just don't need you know it's maybe the, I mean our our coverage on on a lot of this um, as I said is that you know these scenes are very long so. So our coverage would encompass the entire length of the scene. So pretty much every shot you see is a developing shot. Um, and we, we would take our time with it. So the cutting the cutting style as well is very, you know, Alex is very meditative about it in a way. You would hate me saying that, but it is. It feels, it's like it's n- never rushed unless it needs to be. Uh, and it really gives you the viewer time to absorb. And I, I mean, there's there's a fantastic dialogue, very very long dialogue sequence in episode six between Alison Pill and Sonoya uh, across the ta- across the kitchen table. And we, you know, th- that that conversation develops over a very very long period of time. And what they're saying is incredibly important and very odd at times, very unsettling. And the way in which we covered it, you know, we were very, very, we would make very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, finite choices. It was it, the detail in the way in which we were composing those shots was very important to us. Mm. And we would do it, we were, we were doing it, you know, those shots again would be developing shots, but they were moving very, very slowly, incrementally slowly. And so you're, as a viewer, you're then re- required, I guess, in a way, to just hang on every word that she's saying. And that was the most important thing about it. We didn't want it to distract too much at all. In fact, mm. what we were doing and what was being said and how you then, in a dialogue sequence like that, how you emphasise that. And, and you, you have to look at it with a, with a, gaze, a very strong gaze that, that's uh, unflinching, in a way. Mm. And by cutting away from those things, you can feel you can feel the lie, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Cover up. And so, um, and those performances were extraordinary as well. So, it, it's it's so good for the for for, for every single element, especially the acting. That's the other thing, isn't it? Is that cut that it's it um it kind of has to raise the performance level, not just of of you, but yeah, of perfect. cast as well, because they have to carry. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's, no, there's less place to, to hide in terms of performance because you've got yeah. to carry the whole. It's it really makes it push, pushes my, people. To the level. Yeah, I mean, it's like my favorite kind of shot. Favorite kind of shot is generally a sort of mid shot of uh, in a dialogue sequence and with a little headroom and the kind of shot where you can really the camera has proximity to to the person who's speaking. Uh, an unflinching proximity, but at the same time, you have a real sense of the environment as well. And, and I, I like it when it becomes slightly unnerving mm. as well. Um, and, so, and, and, you know, in episode six, that it, it, it's, it has lots of that in that sequence, which is one of my favorite sequences. But this is was one of my favorite episodes, this one, the one we're looking at now, mm. uh, episode seven, visually. Oh, yeah. Back you know, in time. Uh, Everybody's work. There we are. There's me. Amazing. <laughs> did you get? The, did you get the? Um, <laughs> did you get travel time? You know? Did you get? Anyway. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> no it's you get, didn't get paid the travel time. I mean, you know, <laughs> outrageous.
Can I say something about this, Laurie, that's really interesting? Is it is, uh, oh, the I was given up with... Hang on. There he is. Oh. Sorry. Uh, lens artifacts in there. That's sort of, that's. Yeah. Rather be. Yeah, and and you know and you've got with a shot like that, you've got Alex just off camera with a with a sort of puffy thing, uh, <laughs> really going for it with the sparks, uh, not the spark, the actual sparks, as in the the team of sparks. Yes. But, right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, Ace, do you wanted to say something about? Yeah, I was going to say. Um... When I saw uh, the lighting rig and that the, the lights would just be going up and down and up and down rhythmically, I was very worried that, like we have if we're grading something shot on a train, that it would would it cut together? Would there be points where they're at the high point of the light cut together when it was just dipping down? And I don't think there was a single one. I think I asked Alex about it. Um, and, he, you know, he said with Rob talking about that and setting it up in the first place that, they would give the actors lots of time and tell them not to rush so that their lines didn't have to hit any points of those because as an actor, that would have been an absolute nightmare. Um, but, I, you know, it was just perfect. I mean, again, Jake with editing, just to, to be able to cut things at exactly the same point as the lights were going up or down is, is you won't notice it, but it's brilliant editing to be able to meld those two things together, performance and lighting. It's just brilliant. Mm. Also, it feels like there was not. It it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. There was, it was enough. There was enough lack of con, enough inconsistency for it to. You didn't. Yes. You wouldn't have necessarily questioned it. No. No. But. but yeah. <laughs> but, but even if it was there, that is impressive. That is impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and this is I've noticed this in that ep seven was that is the most minimal coverage for a car interior. <laughs> I've ever seen. It's brilliant. That's that shot. I love it. It's beautiful. And she's travelled. And look, and there she is. She's got to the cameras. Yeah. Now, it's, can, you, can you tell me about these rings in the trees? Were they, were they practical lights? Oh, beautiful. Yes. I want to get one of those. Yes. Practical lights that were, made, uh, that were made up a few days prior to us uh, shooting in this, in this particular location, which, in fact... This location was a small crop of redwood trees uh, just northwest of London, uh, I believe, <laughs> northwest maybe. And um, we. Not in Elstree. You know, not in Elstree. We wanted. Um, Windsor. 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 We wanted, Windsor. We wanted like a path that wasn't a sort of runway. And we had long conversations about what, what, what kind of lights were we going to use. In this in this wooded area, that we, you know, we, it was very important. A lot of a lot of important things happened there, and then um, this circular concept came up. And it, at first, it was all about having them on the floor. But then we decided, actually, what if we put them in the trees? And what if we block the top of it so that it only lights downward? And then you have this really odd sense of being on. In this, you know, in this very, it makes the environment quite feel quite surreal. Mm. Uh, we didn't think, we didn't think about the, the result of that. In other words, shots like this that would enable us to do this kind of halo effect. Mm. Uh, that was never something we really considered until the day we were shooting Sergei's murder scene in episode one, and we did this very long crane shot across the top. Um, Carl, who's the actor playing Sergei with a plastic bang on his head, as the crane moves along the floor and goes across the top of his head, and then we look up towards Nick as he steps into place, and and I remember he just he took he took a step too slightly far to his left, and then uh, I was talking to Sam, and the slightly moved slightly moved, and we fell. The camera literally fell into this position where we were looking up. Nick and he had this halo around his head. And we just remember that this, at that moment, it was one of those moments where he was like, okay, this, uh, this is, that's good. This means something. And I imagine we're going to be doing this again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those. I mean, they look like with that cut off. I don't know if you if you ever yeah. helped that out. That cut, the I mean, H they could, they could be stumps, couldn't they? They could be, could you be. know. In the but, HDR, yeah see more but um, I bet yeah it, it, we quite like the idea that, that 
in, on one hand, they could be stumps, but that you sort of you do feel and see into yes going into the darkness, um, which is great. Sounds and then great. both. Oh, hello. And she's just oh god, oh god, oh it's all crawling to bits. Hang on. And she's arrived to to confront. I was just wondering if this was a, was a reflection nightmare. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think this is the actually the beginning of Ep Eight. It's the kind of a prologue on um uh, on on Ep Eight with just a couple of visions. But then I think we've come to ah uh, oh yeah a bit of these visions and i think that oh which is uh, i took some shots of uh of allison in the maglev how did you cover that just just quickly was that because that was obviously that's on the uh, in the studio right that's yeah. right um we had a 50 foot um that was pushed as high as it possibly could be into the ceiling uh we were using one of our h series uh lenses i think maybe like a 20 mil maybe um did you paint the crane base out and then yeah i think there was a, de a certain amount of uh, andrewness uh, well a great deal of andrew yeah well because i guess you have to you have to take the so high that we were actually amongst the lighting gantry so right. we had to so where you see stephen at the top of frame at the end that's actually digital stephen because we had lamps in the way Oh, I see. To get the, because the important thing is to get the move right and we yeah. can deal with everything else around it and obviously looking down is all CG because that's otherwise just the floor of the sound stage okay. um, but the, the capsule itself um, and Sonoya inside it is pretty much totally in camera throughout uh, as is the, the front of the cube and we are extending the cube uh, down to the, to the base right It's her first first time in the Smithsonian. Hmm. I mean, it is a stunning. And if you want to find out what happens, if you haven't seen the series, then it's uh, it's still available. So I would go and watch it. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining me. Um, I, we the, we could keep going because there's so much more to talk about in this series, but it's really. It is a breathtaking piece of work. So congratulations on all of it. You're, uh, you're, um, there will be awards. I can almost guarantee it. So um, congratulations. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, the brilliant BAFTA for hosting us. It's very kind of them. And thank you to the BSC and Audra Marshall and the board for, uh, for all the support. But I want to thank you, Rob Hardy, BSC, and Andrew Whitehurst and Ace Scholl. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Cheers.